Welcome to the COSIN Podcast, bringing you timely insights and strategies to succeed in the ever-evolving world of school system technology. On each episode, you'll hear from certified education technology leaders, visionary district change makers, and instructional experts who will discuss the technology topics making a difference in schools today. And now, enjoy today's show. Welcome to the start of a new mini-series here on the COSIN Podcast. I'm your host, Ross Romano, and I'm pleased to kick off this three-part series on digital and cybersecurity presented by GoGuardian. Today, I'm joined by a pair of technology leaders from the Norris School District in Nebraska. Noel Erskine is the technology director, and Brian Williams is the network administrator, and we're going to discuss how they're analyzing and improving digital security, as well as some of the tools they're using. So, Noel and Brian, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having us. We really, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to share with, with many of our peers out there. Excellent. I think your perspectives are going to be incredibly uh, valuable to our listeners. And, you know, why don't we just kind of start at a high level with, you know, what are the ways in which you are going about analyzing digital security in your district? What are some of the factors you look at? And then what are some of the ways in which you're evaluating how things are working? Well, as a director, we'll kind of team up on this one a little bit. Right. But from a high level side, uh, first of all, we try and stay informed. So obviously, we all know in the digital landscape out there how quickly things are changing and all of the, the attacks, whether it be coming through phishing, whether it be coming in at our perimeter and the firewalls. So first of all, just staying in touch with your peers, whether it be you know podcasts such as this, whether it be uh, state director listservs, which we're a part of, and all the other types of tools. So uh, obviously, that's one, you need to stay informed all of the time. And uh, two, we also like to stay informed with uh, vendors and conferences and so forth. So I think you know, you've got to have the information first to know what's out there. And then from there, you can kind of start evaluating, uh, you know, some of the, the threats that lie within. We recently went through even a, an audit with our insurance provider. And uh, obviously, the insurance companies are getting more in tune with these kinds of cyber breaches and security issues. And so even the insurance industries are starting to become a part of this, where they're even auditing our school districts. And uh, uh, we were pleased that we came through uh, very well with the audit. But I know some schools you know, along the way struggle with certain points of that audit. But those are all good things because obviously it, it makes us all better at what we do. Brian, are there additional things that you're looking at closely? I would just add that, uh, you know, once we do decide on a product or service um, in our environment, we're continually evaluating that to make sure it's continuing to be effective for us. It's doing what we need to do. And if it's not, you know, we're reaching out, we're seeing what other products may be able to take its place out there and uh, try to get a good, I guess, best of breed for what we can maybe afford in the district so that it's, we get the best balance between security and usability. Because at the end of the day, you know, we could be a super secure environment, lock everything down, but it, in, in an educational institution like this, um, you know, that's not going to provide promote student learning. It's, it's going to stifle creativity. And so we just try to maintain the best balance that we can. I think that's key uh, is that balance. Uh, we've all been environments in schools or wherever where the IT department is uh, the adversary of the users. And, you know, that's not what we want. We want an environment where everybody is aware of all of the issues that are out there. And they know that we're there to try and protect them as much as we can. But in the same breath, we're not locking them down to the point where they can't do their job. And I think that is really critical in a school district and even in businesses to have that working relationship with your users. So we feel like we've got a pretty open environment, but in the same breath, an environment where we've got a lot of security protocols in place that are hopefully protecting our students and protecting our, our staff and teachers. What you just touched on is various people, right? The, 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 the constituent groups involved in this from your school leaders, your classroom teachers, your students, your instructional technology coordinators, all the various contributors to ensuring that you have your digital security locked up at every level is another big part of it. In addition to, of course, what technology systems you have in place, uh, you know, how, how do you kind of go about evaluating what's happening in some of those areas? And also, as you mentioned, communicating to them about the expectations that you have for them about the fact that, of course, we're here 
first and foremost to be supporting teaching and learning. So we need tools that are helpful with that. They need to be safe and secure, but we need to find the balance so that it's not restrictive to our number one objective. <laughs> we, if, there, if the tool is incredibly secure and doesn't help you teach, then it's, we should, probably shouldn't be using it, but also we can't have tools that aren't secure. So, But how do you go about looking at some of those constituent groups and what their relative roles are and communicating that to them to make sure that everybody's on the same page? First of all, I like to use a phrase, I, I don't want to be in the ivory tower. You know, you, you want to have a pulse on what's going on out there. And uh, as my job has evolved, as all of our tech directors, I've been at this 20 some years now. And so uh, we've seen a, a lot of evolution along the way with technology uses. And, and of course, our users have evolved along the way as well. So you try and keep your, your pulse out there with your teachers, with our tech integrationists. We've got a, an amazing tech integrationist. He was also a former tech director. So he kind of knows all facets of, of our industry. We want to call it that here within our schools. And, uh, you know, talking to him on a regular basis as well. Of, okay, how, how are things working with the teachers? Because he's the boots on the ground in the classroom. And we're fortunate enough, every school's got a different environment with administration. Uh, we've got an amazing administration here at Norris. And fortunately, we, we have, uh, they have a lot of confidence in us. So, uh, you know, we don't, we're not micromanaged in a lot of areas. And so that's a plus. Uh, but in the same breath, I'm always keeping them informed on issues that I feel like they need to be. So use that blind CC and that CC uh, when you send an email with issues that you think might affect them. You know, I never want an administrator or anybody under my realm to ever be blindsided by something that's happening. So I think that is very relative when it comes to the communication side. Brian, let's kind of start with you to talk about you know, some of the specific tools that you're using. What are just, we could start with however many kind of that really come to top of mind, but some of the particular tools that you're using to really help support good digital security in the district. And can you explain to us a little bit about what are the specific needs that they're addressing? Sure. I, I, I think back to when I was first introduced with technology, you know, um, there was that shiny box that we got in the corner that connected to a computer. So it was a router and a computer. But today there is so many more facets in the system. I mean, you are looking on the edge, you're looking at a firewall, you're looking at antivirus, you're looking at uh, an EDR solution, security awareness training for our end user. I mean, the list goes on. Uh, you could take that with a step further with products such as a, a denial service mitigation tool. And um, we have, uh, luckily we have that in place with our uh, State Department of Education. Um, that helps us mitigate some of those attacks. But uh, as far as some of the individual components, uh, one thing that I utilize all the time on a daily basis is a monitoring tool called PRTG. And that basically correlates a bunch of logs, gives me visual representation of what's going on in our environment, supplement that with our firewall logs, um, with our antivirus logs, bringing each one of those pieces uh, to give a holistic view is pretty much a critical part of the daily routine. We've had uh, our wireless vendor, you know, we supplement uh, products. Uh, one that we just invested in here recently in the past couple of years is a, a, a product called Wybot. And it's basically like having a network engineer on site uh, alerting you to problems that maybe your wireless system doesn't quite know about yet, um, but it can reveal some of those things that you just don't have time to do on a daily basis. Like, I would love to just sit and parse through firewall logs every day and, and really become that champion, know it inside and out. But as we all know, in education and um, in in probably business in general, you just don't have time to do that. You have to, you wear many hats in education. And uh, if Noel has anything to add on that. Yeah, Brian touched on, on Wybot and that is a, an amazing tool for us. So that's definitely one that it was a relatively new tool. It's starting to get some traction here in Nebraska, but that that definitely is, is a, a great product that we found useful. We're kind of a, uh, I don't wanna say a single shop, but you know, we're Windows. And so all of our desktops have been Windows. Now, I don't care if we were Mac, that would be great. 
but we're not trying to support both platforms. And we've been a Google education district for many years. Uh, in fact, the first one in Nebraska to deploy Chromebooks. And so we've been in that business for a long time. So as we look at these tools, we also look at sustainability for one, a cost perspective, but two, just a personnel perspective. And so uh, when we bring these tools to the plate, uh, you know, like Brian mentioned, people are busy and we're all really busy. We don't have time to sometimes dig in the weeds and sometimes you have to, but if you have tools that can alert you ahead of time, it can certainly save you some things. So when we look at security, we look at a lot of the tools we can put in place. And then we also, in the end, we look at the end users. And so, um, you know, we have products um, and we'll probably get into more of these as we go down the road here with some of your questions, but uh, we have email monitoring tools. So we use Bark and Bark will kind of evaluate uh, what's going on for our kids and, and give possible alerts to, to harmful or suicidal activities or, or even some security kinds of issues. Uh, we use another program uh, that's uh, called Auditor and uh, that plugs in and kind of does the same thing. Uh, when we get to our end users, we try and empower them with some tools. Uh, GoGuardian, I noticed the, they're actually the sponsor of this program today, but uh, it is a tool that we use and we love that product. Uh, it empowers the teachers uh, to actually see what's going on in the classroom with the kids. So it's a great educational tool for teachers. It's a tool that also is great for the home because uh, parents can kind of rest assured that there's some filtering on their devices when we send them home. And the school is at least watching, you know, and we're trying to do as much as we can. We all know in this environment, kids are gonna find things they should. And maybe it's on their phone where we have no control over it. Maybe it's on a home computer, but as much as we can do in a school district to protect our children. So we talk about cybersecurity, but you know, that falls into that realm as well. We also try and do as much as we can with education. So as we're working with our teachers, bringing digital citizenship curriculum into the classroom. So it's kind of a, a holistic approach here that we try and have to where our parents know, hey, Norris uh, School District or whatever school district you're in, they're doing as much as we can. And we try to also let them know that yeah, once in a while, something's going to happen, you know, uh, we can't protect them from everything, but we do as much as we can. And if something happens, we address it right away. We're here trying to work hand in hand with parents in that arena as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the answer you just gave and all the things you touched on really speaks to the fact that it's it's a digital world. So digital security is security and it touches on everything. And to, to Brian's point, there are so many things that we just don't have the time to do manually for those of our listeners who are reflecting on your your commitment to this I, you may have heard brian mention that he likes to manually parse through firewall logs when he can <laughs> um so that's a level of commitment that you know better you than me but it's you know all these various things right that we really need to rely on technology to help us with so that we can get it all done and and cover all the areas we need to cover and uh you know one of the things that to me can be really important in that regard of identifying those of, of making sure that we don't have holes and gaps is about the relationships we're able to develop with the vendors we work with and you know having supportive vendors who are helping departments truly understand your needs make sure that you're confident that they're being met you know we have technology leaders, of course, who are at all across the spectrum of experience levels, right? I know Noel, early in your career, you were a classroom teacher before you transitioned in these roles. So there's a lot of things that at that time, you may not have realized were needs. And then as you get experienced, you know, you either are identifying, okay, we have these key needs, we need to find a tool to meet them. But sometimes it's a legitimate process that you're going to learn about some tools that are available and then track that back and say, ooh, we do need to cover that and we're not doing that yet. Or things are so ever evolving in the digital space that there's new things constantly popping up to say, oh, we do need something to address that or we need something better to fit that niche. It, it's no longer covered under this other platform that we're using for a bunch of other things. Can you kind of speak a little bit to to both sides of that equation, to the, the technology leaders in the districts, but also to the vendors working with the districts about what that relationship really should look like to make sure that everyone is kind of on the same page regarding what are the needs we're addressing, how are we doing that, and how are we 
facilitating success in that regard because it really is a collaborative effort. It is. And one thing I might mention too, I'm, we're, we're very methodical in what we decide to select and deploy. And sometimes you see a need there and you can look at a tool, maybe it's a, uh, I know this is a security side of things, but it, it all kind of ties in, whether it be a GoGuardian product, a YBOT product, or even sometimes a, an LMS that you're selecting for your district. We try and make sure that what we do is sustainable long-term as well. So when you get into something, you know, maybe there's a little government money initially there or some state money that will get you started. Well, that's great. The last thing I want to do is get into a project into two years. And then in three or four years, you're pulling that rug out from under your, your teachers or maybe even uh, Brian with the network tool, you know, and all of a sudden, well, sorry, Brian, this was a great tool, but now we can't deploy it within our district because of a cost. So I think even though I laugh and I tell the vendors, well, cost doesn't matter, but it, it does, you know, no matter what you're doing, it does come down to that. You only have so big of a pie to slice and you have to decide how to slice that out. So we're very methodical in what we try and deploy. You know, a couple of tools I mentioned to you, BART, we use the free version of that. So it doesn't cost us anything. An auditor the same way. GoGuardian brings so much to the table. We pay for that. We feel like that's a great subscription. Same way with YBot. So, you know, it's all across the board as you look at these, uh, these products. Uh, but sustainability is, is a big one. Brian, in, in your role, you know, with respect to the resources and support the vendors provide or the, the way in which they can play a helpful role in sometimes identifying some individual needs and gaps that might be out there that you may want to look into. How does that play into your role? You know, like Noel said earlier, we try to have our pulse on everything. We like to know what's going on, what products are available to us. And then if we really see a product that we're interested in, sure, let's, let's get an evaluation in, let's kick the tires and then we can start that conversation, you know, with uh, pricing, sustainability. And so it's, it's having that role with the vendors that, that's crucial, that you stay in communication with them. As much as I hate getting spam by a ton of companies, you know, it's, it's like, oh, okay, um, you know, XYZ just came out with a new widget here. Um, let's, let's take a look at this. Let's see. Let's uh, stay up, you know, current trends in the industry and uh, then make our decisions. One, do we have a need for that? Because, you know, a company can say, hey, you really need this. And it's like, well, let's evaluate this. Do we as a district need this? Do we need to move forward with something? Or, you know, we could say, well, maybe down the road we can look at something like this, but our current needs really don't fit our district at this time. We do look at some of the vendors uh, from a support standpoint, too. So like Brian mentions the evaluation of the products and then not only the, the vendor we're working with, but sometimes they're selling you the product. And then obviously, maybe it's a Cisco product. So you got to rely on Cisco for the support or maybe they're selling you the whatever product it is, but you're relying on that other company for support. So it's not only the vendor that's selling you the product, but then the back end of the support that we constantly look at it. And, and that's all a part of the evaluation process. You have to build that in. When, when I work with vendors, I always tell them I am painfully honest with them. So, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to play a dancing game with them. Sometimes I will just say, yeah, I'm sorry, your product is just too costly or I'm sorry, it just doesn't have this, this, or this. Uh, and, and I feel like vendors, they wanna know. You know, they wanna know why, why is it you're interested or why is it you're not interested or what can we do to, to keep you or what can we do to get you as a customer? So I approach it as kind of that. And I've had a lot of vendors tell me, hey, we just appreciate your candor of knowing where you're at. And I'm not scared when it comes to, you know, making them sharpen their pencil for pricing. Don't be scared to do that as well. Even though you might love a product, you've got another product that may be almost as good. And if they're a lot cheaper, it's okay to tell that vendor, you know, I'm, I'm really looking at switching. And sometimes I've done that before and they actually had to switch. So I just be very upfront with your vendors. And I look at it as a partnership with them too. You know, it's uh, a lot of good vendors out there, not just the ones that we use, but uh, I try and treat them right. And they try and treat us right. This episode of the Cozen Podcast is brought to you by GoGuardian. 
We all know that educational technology opens many doors, but not all doors are safe or appropriate for students to walk through, especially during class. With GoGuardian's suite of digital learning solutions, educators can deliver engaging lessons with powerful formative assessments to help all students thrive, while also ensuring students have thoughtful guardrails to help keep them safe and focused. Visit GoGuardian.com to learn how GoGuardian, Pear Deck, and Edulastic are helping thousands of K-12 schools supercharge the learning potential of every student. And it could very well help you this time or next time or help other districts because if there's a vendor that has a really great tool but they're hearing routinely well this isn't really fitting into budgets here right or there's a it has nine out of ten things we need but you really need to focus on this other thing it can help them maybe refine that approach that helps you to have access to the tool helps the other districts around have access so i think that dialogue can be helpful because ultimately they are there to help you. And one of the things you uh, touched on earlier, Noel, uh, is the state funding that are some that sometimes is available to help with these regards. And I think briefly, kind of touching back on that grant funding that might be available, um, or you know, some of the ways you might use funds like that in the procurement phase to acquire cybersecurity resources. And of course, those are going to be a little bit different state to state, but each state has somewhat of a structure for having these funds and going through and evaluating them. But like, I guess when you think about how those fit into your process, where, you know, when you're thinking about procurement or tools that you need, uh, are there certain times when you specifically look to some of those state funds or grants that are out there to address those needs? Uh, is it just kind of an ongoing rolling part of your evaluation? Yeah, that's a tough one when it comes to questions on grants, because obviously some districts have, uh, larger districts will have folks that that's their responsibility to go out and find grants, not only in the computer realm, but student safety and, and uh, curriculum things. And so we're, we're not a district that's that large to have a special person that that's their duty. Uh, when it comes to the tech side of things, it has varied a lot over the years. Nebraska right now really does not have any uh, grants specifically to schools in Nebraska, but obviously some of your listeners may. And I think that's something you definitely wanna keep a pulse on within your state, uh, whether it's uh, talking to other uh, technology directors or other uh, network administrators in schools. But when it comes to the federal side of things, most of the listeners here will be familiar with your E-rates. And recently, recently, now with a lot of the COVID monies that came in, obviously these are some one-time monies that are coming in. Each district's going to deal with those in different ways because there's only certain buckets that those can go into. Uh, one thing I always mention with grants, if you're going after a grant, look at what the evaluation rubric is. And, and I'm talking more specific grants, not the E-rate side of things. Look at how that grant's evaluated and make your grant to where it's a step-by-step -step process as they read through, they can easily see what, the, what they're evaluating. So if the evaluation says 10 points for whatever it is in that grant, you wanna have a specific area that addresses that uh, part of your grant. Uh, so that's just a little tip on writing grants. But when it comes to the E-rate side of things, uh, you know that's a cycle a five-year cycle, so uh, people are kind of used to that. And when you're working with those federal grants, you just have to build that into your cycle locally. So, you know, you can look out five, 10 years and say, okay, we replaced wireless this year. I'm hoping to get five years, three years, eight years, whatever you think you can get out of that. And you're gonna kind of put that in a metric to figure out when are the times that I'm gonna use those E-rate grants or other grants that come in during that cycle. So I mentioned sustainability with all this. So I really think, you know, your department needs to have something that shows every year we're locked into this subscription or every fifth year we're replacing desktops or, or tablets or whatever it is. So it's kind of that long-term planning that fits into there too. When it comes to the evaluation of tools at, at the acquisition phase. So before a district is using a particular tool and evaluating how it's working, now I'm thinking about what tools do I need? Maybe I am new to my role and I'm looking at what we're using and what our needs are. And if we want to stick with this or go with something else, maybe I'm just doing routine evaluation tools, trying to meet a new need. But, you know, in general, is there a specific 
checklist and this could you know, be a little bit different, I think, according to each of your roles and the specific things you're looking at, but kind of a, a process that you would recommend or a certain, a, just a certain way of approaching, I guess, um, that process. So I think we've touched on some of these things already. We've touched on having that candid dialogue with vendors to say, well, this is really what I need. This is what's missing. Communicating your needs clearly to them so that you can see if they can help you to meet them or not. But also, of course, for various uh, things, there are multiple potential tools that are out there. And the same one might not be the best thing for every district. And, in, you know, and so in a case of a smaller district or a rural district versus a large urban, it, there's a, a lot of different things to evaluate. But for each of your peers, right, in your roles in whatever district they're in, is there kind of a way that you would outline that approach to considering what is best for us, for our needs? You know, it's, it's a big question, but you can kind of narrow it down however you think is best. Sure. And yeah, that is a big question. <laughs> you know, it, it's, uh, it's one of those, I, I think when you were first asking this question, I was thinking right away about our personnel in the school. And so you've got to have confidence in the folks that you have in your arenas. Uh, and what do I mean by that? So once you've maybe selected the tool, we're already using a lot of tools, most of our districts are. And so uh, I may not be necessarily familiar with the specific messaging tool that we're using. I know the company, I've logged in a couple of times, maybe know how to send a message. That's not really my wheelhouse. My wheelhouse is to make sure we got a good platform so all of our users are using it. But we, I've got a lot of trust in our users out there, our power school administrator here at the district. Uh, she's amazing. And she was an individual that actually provided support for uh, 70 schools in Nebraska as a part of a cooperative. And we hired her. She's in our district now just for our school. So I've got so much confidence in all of the folks. Uh, Brian Williams is amazing. I embarrass him every time, but uh, he was a former technology director and, and now he's a network manager here for us. He's done it all. And I truly believe he's one of the best in the business. So the folks that I have in those arenas, I also put a lot of, of faith in. And so when they're working with the end user, they're working with the tool, when they say something like, you know, there's another product out here that's got a couple extra feature sets, uh, just had that happen with our power school manager. Uh, she's following the list serves. She's hearing all of the things that are happening out there. She knows what our end users here are doing with messaging. And there's a couple of new features and a, and a few things that we wish our messaging platform had. And now she's looking at another messaging platform. So uh, that kind of boils, uh, boils down our process as far as, you know, one, once you've selected a product, be willing to change, know what's out there. And your vendors are a great part of that. But sometimes uh, I like visiting with a lot of peers and how they're using it. Uh, we recently rolled out uh, badging on our buses right in the middle of that project. And I called a bunch of school district. I talked to somebody in Oregon, talked to somebody in Ohio, talked to some several people in Texas. I literally called the bus barn, talked to the bus barn people, said, hey, I'm just a user looking at this product. Is it good? Are you using it? So, uh, you know, I, I, the vendor directed me this direction, but then you got to go that extra step. It's kind of like hiring people. You know, when you hire somebody, you hire well, and then you don't have to worry about it. Same is true with a lot of those products. You get a good product, then you don't have to worry about it. So, uh, you know, that's, we don't have a rubric necessarily. Can you think of anything there? No, and I, I think that really is dictated on the size of the school district. I mean, a small district is going to have completely different needs from a larger district. And I think that through conferences and through local tech meetings, you then kind of split off into your subgroups of, you know, your, your small, your medium size, your larger districts, and those tech directors get together and then you compare notes. And then every now and then it's like, oh, uh, you know, this, this smaller district or larger district might be doing something that you would like to do. And then and you still are able to pull from each one of those avenues but, uh, you know, your, your, your core co cohort group of similar sized districts, that leads you to maybe use the same tools that uh, have been in place or that are serving their needs that could potentially uh, serve ours as well. I think, you know, one of the, the key points, too, was that the willingness to change, to say, well, we thought this was 
going to be great, but it turned out to not be exactly what we needed. Or I, I used this particular tool in another role or another district that I was in, and it was really good. So I was inclined to want to use it here again. And we found out that it just wasn't exactly right. You know, that it's not about, it's not a good tool, but it's about, it's just not necessarily fitting what we need right now or the specifics of our district. Is that kind of an ongoing evaluative process that of course, once you're really confident that you have the right things, you don't want to have to worry about that all the time. <laughs> but still, it is part of the process of checking back and saying, okay, is this functioning the way we need it to function? Or is it, is there just something about this district that's different from what we heard from another district? And that's meaning it's just not exactly working right for us. Uh, is there anything else you might want to add on that one, Brian? Brian's pausing on I'm this one. That was, a, on this that was a tough question. <laughs> I, one thing I might add from my perspective is sometimes you have to have a long-term vision. And, and if you're sure that vision's right, you, you jump on it. We, we jumped on Google early on. And there were a lot of school districts here in Nebraska and other places that had not jumped on, the, on Google. You know, it was cloud-based. It was... I can remember we ran an ex old uh, uh, Exchange server. Uh, you know, the guys have been in the business a long time, know exactly that's Microsoft Exchange email server. Brian ran one in the district he was at. And so as we moved into the Google platform, that was a, a, a big transition. You know, I had some elementary teachers that were very upset that they had to give up Microsoft Publisher. And uh, five years later, I had those same teachers that came to me and a couple of them said, you know, we thought you were crazy at the time. We just, and it was kind of tough on a couple little changes, but they said, oh my gosh, we couldn't go back. There's no way we could go back. So sometimes it is, is saying, you know what, this is the best direction and this is what we're going to do. You know, I know a lot of schools out there use uh, smart boards or interactive whiteboards, you know, that kind of thing. Our district is, uh, we've held off on some of those for a long time. We have some in our elementary, our K-2 arena, but the sustainability, obviously, when you're putting that kind of technology in every classroom, you've got to be able to swap it around every so many years. And so, you know, there was districts, I remember, that bought those things and and three, three fourths of their teachers, uh, they just pushed them in the corner and asked people to get them out of there. And the other fourth might have used them amazingly. So sometimes just because there's something great out there, you, you do have to look at it long term. You also have to look at it. Can we roll this out and make it effective? Uh, Seesaw, we pushed that product out. It's not a security product, but we did it very slow. We did a, a year or so of the free product and, and similar to a GoGuardian, we looked at it and said, wow, this is a great tool. We're going to go ahead and purchase it. And, and, but we had a plan in place. So, and it's one now that we're not going to pull it out from under them uh, in the, the, the long term. Uh, we're going to stay with those products. So sometimes it's having that vision. You know, along the way here, we mentioned the end user, but I think in our district, because Brian's got all these things in place, uh, firewall, uh, you know, he's got all of the antivirus, he's got backups offsite, we've got all sorts of things in place, but literally it's the end user that is, when it comes to security, that is uh, the, the key here. And we, early on, we purchased a product called Know Before. There's a couple other products here along the way now that are competitors to that company. But basically, uh, it's training end users on phishing and security things. Uh, we actually have phishing campaigns that, uh, that hits their inbox. And the teacher has to decide, is this a legitimate email or not? And if not, they can mark it as phishing. Uh, and obviously some of them are, are fake phishing campaigns, but a lot of them are real phishing things that teachers are getting in their inbox. So the end user security is something that I, I definitely, and that may have been one of your questions coming up, but that's something I definitely feel like we need to talk about when it comes to security too. I mean, it, it is all about the end user. And, and I think we've touched on that a, a few times about how their experience and you know, how it affects them is contributing to the decisions that you're making about what you need to do, because ultimately, if the end user experience is not going to be a positive one, then <laughs> there's no point in doing anything, right? It, it needs to be about serving them. So, you know, before we, we wrap up here, I think one of the things that we've certainly have talked about here and, and referenced is the importance of 
all of your staff, your stakeholders, your constituent groups, understanding cybersecurity, having some training relative to whatever their role is uh, in protecting themselves, right? You can't just, as you said, you don't want to be in the ivory tower. Even if you were, you can't do everything from a central location. The technology doesn't do everything by itself. There are real people using these things and the people need to understand some of the decision making that they need to to take part in to just ensure that they're not creating additional risks or perhaps communicating to you, oh, this thing's happening. <laughs> we need to fix this right before it gets out of hand. So we don't have time, of course, to talk about every stakeholder group, but maybe for each of you, you can choose one <laughs> and then uh, maybe explain a little bit about either what's the most urgent reason that comes to mind for you why that particular group needs to be trained in cybersecurity, or if even if it's not the number one reason, maybe a reason that you think a lot of tech leaders haven't necessarily thought about why it's important to not forget about this group of staff or stakeholders, whichever group you want to identify. And, and we can't touch on all, but maybe each of you could just choose one to highlight to close it out. Sure. I, I, I think from my perspective, we just touched on this. It's the end user. And, and with, with the ransomware uh, situation out there, um, if we can train our users to be aware, to know what to look for, um, because we're just one click away from, you know, a disaster, potentially. You know, we, we like to have other systems in place where we hope we can, you know, avert that if that would potentially happen. But uh, sometimes it can be a pain. Uh, so we recently activated uh, two-factor authentication for all of our teachers and made that uh, a mandate to um, hopefully augment um, our current security practices that we have and just add another layer, hoping to, uh, I guess, to potentially avoid any disasters uh, like that. And so it, it can be painful for the end user at times. So that's why training um, explanation saying, hey, yes, it is a pain. Um, you will get used to it and trying to hopefully convey that across that this is, this is best for you. It's best for our students. Um, there's, a, there's a sign in our, on our board and uh, in our boardroom that says, is it, is it best for students? And so we try to look at that in all decisions and uh, think, okay, if we purchase this product, this service, if we do this policy, is this uh, truly going to be best for our students? And then if we can bring that and incorporate this with technology, with curriculum, you know, then we have successful outcomes. Brian's right. He stole my answer. Yeah, the, the <laughs> staff. But actually, uh, you know, I, I would, I'll go one step and further and just say administration now, because we all deal with school administration and of course our, our teachers and other staff is a part of that. But uh, that good working relationship, I think, is always critical there. And having leaders that are willing to, one, uh, not, not only support you, but also utilize the technology and do the things that, that you expect your end users to do. So, you know, Brian mentioned two-factor authentication. Our administration had been doing that already. So, you know, that was when they had been uh, role modeling, as you, you might say, to our end users. And so then when we rolled out the end users, it's not something that uh, they feel like they're the only ones that are, are being picked on in that situation. And I think it goes back to that. You got to have some street credibility with your end users. So if they think the IT is an adversary or, gosh, what are they doing now or what are they requiring now, you know, I've been a teacher in the classroom, so we, we know what a battle they face every day uh, when the bell rings and, and kids are coming in. So we try and take that perspective. And then when you do things, um, they realize that, okay, there's a reason we're doing this. And yeah, you're always going to have a few that, that uh, maybe want to do more of it and others that are like, oh gosh, this is kind of a hassle, but at least they're not against you for doing that. So definitely keep a Keep your pulse on what's going on out there and have your, your staff supportive of you and you supportive of them. I think uh, that's all spot on and it's a, a great place to wrap it up is reflecting on that question of is it best for students and everything we do in schools and school districts and always tracking back to that. That's, I mean, a really 
that's the guiding principle, right? That'll help us all do our jobs effectively. So thank you, Brian Williams and Noel Erskine for taking the time to be part of the Cozen Podcast. And listeners, make sure you subscribe to the Cozen Podcast on your preferred platform to hear the rest of this mini series and many more episodes on other important and timely topics. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Cozen Podcast, produced in partnership with Mind Rocket Media Group. Visit mindrocketmediagroup.com to connect with our expert team and learn how we can support your education industry, communications, and marketing goals. And to make sure you never miss an episode of the podcast, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. You can also listen to each new episode on edcircuit.com or cosin.org.